dollars yep, in total. It is currently four yeah. p.m. At this present moment, we are going to begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask you if you're ready to lead us in the house. Uh, would everybody please put their right hand over their heart? Ready, begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Without turning over to a roll call, I'm going to defer to the panel services director at work. Am I actually going to our new executive assistant? Our new executive assistant, Natalie, will be taking roll. Commissioner McGrath. Oh, thank you. Uh, Maria Lennox? Here. Gary Blake? Present. Sandra Krakos? Uh, Sharon McGee? I'm here. Okay. Alejandro Fab? Present. Maxine Henderson? Here. Alberta Vanette? Here. Uh, Jason Keckle Moore? Here. Angela Heffman? Here. And Director Christine Watson, present. Okay, at this present moment, we will now be turning to public comments for items listed and not listed on the agenda. A three minute limitation shall apply to each member of the public who wishes to address the Animal Control Commission on any item on the agenda, excluding public hearings. Though topics must remain within the purview of the Animal Services Department. There is no limit to the number of items that may be discussed within the three minute time limit. Just for the sake of ground bearing, I understand that there were some questions regarding my and the commission's authority to extend the public comment threshold. However, for the city clerk's office, the three minute time limit must remain. At this moment, I will now call on the first speaker. All right, we have uh, Fred Namoli. Good afternoon. Is it three minutes? Yes. Um, I was uh, I was originally going to remind you all of the uh, resolution 2018-45, uh, which was passed on um, February uh, 21st of 2018 by 42 uh, with one extension. And um, that resolution, to refresh your memory, uh, creates the Animal Control Commission, which is probably what we're here for today. And it describes what the animal control of the commission is, the commission's mission is, uh, as an advisory, as an liaison, et cetera. Um, but as I was doing that, I came across a copy of the draft minutes from Wednesday, September 20th, 2023. They made it 2020, excuse me, 2023. And uh, reading through the agenda and the minutes, the agenda indicates that there is an oral presentation on the facility uh, updates, uh, oral presentation. There is no transcription of that oral presentation attached to the minutes, so no, nobody knows what that is. Um, there was a statistic presentation which was attached to the minutes, and then the discussion of upcoming events. Uh, again, uh, no transcription or summary of those upcoming events that we discussed, so nobody knows what that is. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, commission passed the Brown Act and Rosenberg's rules. The Brown Act is basically a sunshine law here in California. Um, so what caught my interest was that the special meeting was dated September 20, 2023. Uh, it went on for roughly two and a half hours. The first 30 to 40 minutes was public comments, pledge of deletion, etc. But the rest of it was these discussion items that do not appear in the minutes. Um, and then uh, what also caught my eye was that the resolution passed in February of 2018. And uh, now we are holding on what appears to be um, a special meeting to adopt Brown's Act and the Rosenberg rules. So that tells me that pretty much either the commission operated without those rules or did not have a meeting, its first meeting, until September 20, 2023, five and a half years after the resolution was adopted. So did anything happen in between? Thank you, sir. Please follow the next speaker. 
Lydia Savala. To discuss um, a recent incident, not in our county, but next door in Orange County. And this was an article that I received from Planet in the week uh, regarding mauling of a volunteer at the Orange County Animal Shelter, 15 year. Um, volunteer and she sustained um, 90 puncture wounds to both arms, which ultimately required surgery. And thank God she survived. Uh, and in reading about that, they made reference to certain publications and guidelines, professional guidelines that I was not familiar with as long as I've been involved in animal care and rescue. So I went to these, uh, I went to the grand jury report, which is like 51 pages, and I read the entire report. And some of the things, and some of the things that they cited are common to some of the same, the same issues that we have here in San Bernardino or, you know, other shelters have as well, um, lacking, you know, written guidelines, policies, procedures, standards for evaluating animal behavior, uh, no systemic training or uh, inadequate record keeping, absence of a certified behaviorist, uh, inadequate dog enrichment program. Uh, but in, in doing so, the most important thing that, 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 that in addition to my concern about the mauling and the fear of maulings in our own shelter, not just as it relates to people, but to other dogs, because I've worked with an animal behaviorist uh, for over you know a, a dozen years, and in his private kennel, he would never put more than one dog in a kennel uh, unless they were dogs that were uh, familiar with each other and you know shared the same food. He said once you put more than two dogs in a kennel, you've increased the likelihood for an aggress aggressive attack and mauling a thousand times, a thousand times. And I know that out of circumstance that there are multiple dogs being placed in tennis, which is just a death sentence. And it also means it's, it's inevitably, when staff comes in in the morning, I know for a fact that there are dogs that are injured, if not killed from, from these maulings. A reference to three important manuals of uh, the NACA, the National Animal Care and Control Association, has uh, procedural guidelines that I think are incumbent upon every commissioner at this at these tables to be familiar with and, and should be read by all of us who have an interest in here. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your comments. Okay, next Paige Miller. Yeah, good and Director Watson. Uh, I founded the Page Project, and what I do is collect uh, new and used items uh, for various animal rescue groups in a number of different counties. Um, this past year has been especially bad for people just dumping, dumping their large dogs, sometimes two or three at a time in San Bernardino, especially in Ward 7, on the Wash, Golf Course, in particular, the German Shepherd, Malinois, and Husky breeds, and now kittens and cats are being dumped. Ward 7 residents have continually stepped up, uh, rescued the paper spay neuters, and fostered to adopt to play the risk videos. Um, the question, mandatory spay neuter in San Francisco, who's enforcing, who is fining, and if not, why not? So now the services code, there needs to be more bark and bite behind this, and you need to know it's mandatory. You need to uh, communicate that to the uh, community. Um, recently, while looking up, up on Google Maps in the Nina area of Ward 7, a business popped up. Must love German Shepherd dogs. Located 
at 3705 Valencia. Website confirms they are breeders. They now have five week old puppies advertised for $2,000 off. Really? Go to the shelter. Do they, these folks, I, I'd like to know, uh, there's people that are operating in the city. They have a business license. Is their breeder's license required in the city? And is there follow through? Who is enforcing? Uh, I've advocated the council also for a mobile spay neuter unit, uh, a van to be placed at various locations. I know that it's in the works. What is the status of that? In the meantime, I agree with Lydia from Cooch Ranch. Can we book the Animal Action League, spay neuter van, or some other kind of partnership? Get out to the parks, get into State Brothers parking lot. Uh, I've also asked to the council, which is always falling on deaf ears, uh, to promote one or two animals periodically at a meeting. You're just down the street. For heaven's sakes, this this senior puppy dog needs a home. This little kitten just came in. Um, not, a, not a lot to ask for communication and marketing. Okay? I always ask uh, the, uh, and advise the council that their constituents in every ward are dumping animals and they are not spaying and neutering. Okay? That communication needs to come from every council member at every meeting, and it needs to come from the dais. I'd like to suggest this commission if not already done, you write up several firm goals that are needed and not only send them to the council, please don't send them. Stand up in front, read it at the council meeting as a member of the commission. Okay? One, two, three, four. That way, nobody, nobody can say they didn't know, they didn't hear you. There's a wonderful concept for a new facility, which uh, Director Watson gave a public presentation on. Uh, in the mean, meantime, we need to be a now. I do believe that is the expiration. Okay. Point. And also have uh, spay neuter flyers, low income that have passed out throughout different businesses. So, thank you, ma'am. Alejandro Fox. Hello, everyone. A few weeks ago, Councilman Ben Reynoso. Animal Services Director Chris Watson and I had the opportunity to tour Mitchell's Ranch, Animal Kennel and Rescue located in the North, North Vermont area. Owned and run by Gordon Kevin Mitchell. Mitchell's Ranch has evolved from a small pet grooming service to a full fledged boarding and rescue operation. Mitchell's Ranch is currently applying for a conditional use permit and business license from the city. The CUP would grant a special exemption for Mitchell's Ranch to operate from a residence without impacting the area's zoning regulations. This exemption would presumably expire should Mitchell's Ranch cease operation. As they await approval from city officials, I strongly encourage my fellow commissioners to speak to their appointers about Mitchell's Ranch, their journey to licensure, the conditional use permit, and the opportunities their work presents for animal welfare here in San Bernardino. Laura and Kevin Mitchell are in the audience tonight, and we greatly appreciate the support. Thank you. Rosie Shields. <clears throat> Hello. This is kind of more from my heart, and I guess from working with the rescues. Uh, my name is Rosie Shields. I'm a retired uh, county CAD employee, and I also work a couple days a week at the Mitchell Ranch. I take care of all the little ones, uh, the little dogs. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of, um, sorry, and also, I'm also a homeowner here in San Bernardino. I've lived here 14 years. I'm here to speak on behalf of the rescues that I volunteer for. Um, I also, I do Husky fostering. I'm kind of dedicated to the Huskies. Um, I also foster for several Husky rescues outside of San Bernardino, but we pull from the San Bernardino shelter. Um, I feel like staffing um, 12 employees for, a three, for 300 dogs is just not enough. Those animals are in their kennels for the majority of the day, if not all, if not all day. These dogs are suffering from, from kennel stress, which causes bites, which cause mama to eat babies. It caused, I've had that actually happen in my care as a foster, and I was feeding her. So um, I just I appeal to you and city council to approve funding for more shelter staff. You have to go to city council. You have to get this approved. The U.S. is suffering from an animal welfare crisis. Again, we appeal to you and City Council for approval of more funding 
San Bernardino is in need of spay neuter programs, campaigns, education. I've come across a lot of homeless with pets. Uh, we're also needing incentives, spay neuter programs, campaigns for them to stop the unwanted breeding within the homeless community. That has to be addressed. Um, I'm happy that Chris is getting an assistant. Uh, we, I urge you, we also urge you to approve that as well. Um, there has to be some help in this. Uh, even the fast food chains have managers, assistant managers, and ship leaders. Come on, you got to do this. Um, and I, we appeal to you to go to city council and get this passed. Um, San Bernardino needs a comparable salary to attract a San Bernardino shelter vet. We again appeal to you for approval of a higher salary for a vet. We need a resident vet. Uh, to provide low-cost space uh, spay neuter at an, at an affordable cost. Only you, the AC committee or and city council, can provide the answers for our animal welfare crisis. Chris, Chris can bring all her ideas to fruition. Cannot bring all her ideas to fruition without approval from the committee and city council. Chris has her hands tied. She can't see any of her programs, incentives, and educational programs brought forward without your help. Under the leadership of Chris, you can do the follow the This is the day of the back. Three minutes. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. George on the press. Hello again, commissioners. First, the minutes are grossly inaccurate and hope they are corrected now. Also, the meeting is recorded in its entirety. If you would like to reference what was stated, included, including the public comments, I never requested free adoptions. I am concerned about the recommendations for another top level director position for 100 plus pay recently approved by city council when the shelter is most desperate for is more of those in direct contact with these animals. The current environment is horrible and we must do better. There are no laws showing if animals were fed, medicated, et cetera, because the response I was given is there isn't enough time. Then why are we hiring enough? Why, why aren't we hiring enough so that there is? I have seen emaciated animals and others clearly ill, but no updated kennel notes to indicate they are being treated. Are they destined for death and not worthy of proper care? That's a sincere question that I'm asking. And if we need more money, then the community needs to be aware of that so we can demand more for our shelter. There has been pleas for donations of food. Maybe you all should look into our budgeting needs and not just take what you're told at face value. I would like to see more of your time spent on action items addressing the welfare of these animals and less time listening to staff reports. If you have questions about what is provided in the packet, you can ask, what is the commission currently working on to help address this crisis because we see nothing? Just because the other surrounding areas may be dealing with the same issues, doesn't mean we should just give up and continue killing them. We are not going to climb out of this mess with our hands in our pockets. We are now also prioritizing time and money to renovate areas for new admin when what we are desperately, desperately need our temporary kennels to house over 100 plus excess we don't have room for. We are stacking four and five dogs on top of each other, causing excess stress, some even tearing each other apart, thus expediting their kill day. This also places our staff and volunteers in a dangerous environment, which is a liability for our city. We need a town hall meeting for the commissioners and community so you can hear us. We are desperate for you to listen to our overwhelmed citizens that are left to carry the burden of these strays, some bankrupting themselves. It's criminal because there aren't enough animal control officers to help. Many don't come out and tell citizens to leave them on the street. Last, you are unreachable outside of this meeting. You didn't receive my email that I sent on the 5th until today when it only required forward, which takes a few seconds. It went out after I wrote it again to follow up on the email and the errors for this meeting, though I included the city council this time. Let's work together to make things happen and be the beacon for change for these voiceless, sentient beings. I plan to stay for a few minutes after the meeting if any of you have a minute to talk. Thank you. Ma'am, are there any additional speakers? There are no additional speakers. Understood. 
this present moment, we're going to now move on to our consent calendar and the approval of draft minutes from the September 20th, 2023, our special commission meeting. Please have to take a moment to review those minutes, minutes for accuracy. Do you apologize? What was the question? The minutes reflect the correct things that were being listed okay. based on the email received. Okay. Um, in that present case, can I get a motion to amend the meeting and to reflect the, the comments that were given to us in the meeting? Well, I, I have all correspondence from uh, the above uh, citizens that uh, made statements at our meeting. Can I get a second? Just one second. Okay. Um, so, so what are the specific corrections that you wanted to make, Mr. Blake? I do apologize. Oh, the last speaker, um, it says they are requested free adoptions, and according to correspondence, uh, the last speaker uh, said that's incorrect. Okay. So just move to either strike that or um, what she actually requested or what she actually said if 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 it's a uh, you know in the correspondence. Okay. We could just strike uh, strike that. If that's if that's something is it something that we could potentially remove from the record is is what so is. so we could we so this is like a correction right so um so we would um, state that um she uh, requested that we don't do free adoptions um it is just a summary so the the not everything that somebody said is included in it and so we do try and summarize as much as possible. Um, but we will, we can absolutely correct that based on, on that. And then this would be the time to submit or offer any other changes that, that you see in errors that you see. Okay. And that's really and, and, and also, um, I was just kind of curious, uh, the meeting started at, or the meeting was supposed to start at 3.30 mm -hmm. and then pretty much they have, uh, everybody listed at 3.40. The meeting did not start until 3.43 because we had some delays. Yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. But I just kind of wondering if it didn't start to like 3.43 and it kind of looks like we showed up at like three minutes prior okay. to the meeting. Yeah. If, if, but I'm just saying the people that probably got here at 3.40 were actually here at 3.30. Okay. So if that could get corrected too. Yes, I did not request the commissioners to be included in that was that me. Was yes. Okay, so I'll make a motion with all the corrections that have been stated here in the commission uh, that we pass the minutes with the corrections. It's been uh, moved by Commissioner Blake. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, it's moved and been moved by Commissioner Blake and seconded by Commissioner Captain Moore. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Going ahead and moving on now to our staff update on programs and services. I will now defer to Animal Services Director Christine Watts. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I uh, appreciate um, appreciate it. Um, all right. So, just a couple of updates. Um, our new RBT um, started on Monday, October the second. Um, we're excited to have her as part of our team. Um, she has already hit the ground running and, and put some um, changes into place to assist staff. Um, and um, she is able to do some medical, not medical, not veterinary procedures, but she's able to do some things on site um, with approval from the vet, including um, things like skin scrapes. So it's so over to advanced pet care in order to perform a skin scrape and determine whether, whether an animal with a skin issue has a contagious disease we're able to do that on site and then she would um, refer back to the vet in order to get like 
treatment and stuff to see what what's approved for those. Um, so we're really excited about that. She's also been able to do some some eye tests on some animals. Um, so that helps us um, reduce the cost that we're paying to advance pet care for those services, which is a huge benefit. Um, Human Resources is reaching out to the next candidate on our established list for RBTs. If they are still interested, then we may be able to onboard the other RBT position that was granted by the Mayor and City Council um, sooner rather than later. They would still have to go through the background process, but that's definitely something that, that is very good for us and for the animals um, because then we would have vet staff, although they're not a veterinarian, they are trained to recognize issues and illnesses and stuff. Um, better than, than line staff are, and we would have somebody there every day of the week, so we'd have some coverage um, to catch some of those urgent issues. Um, and then um, the vacant animal services representative has accepted the position and is currently in the background check process. Um, just so you're aware, animal services representative positions um, are um, one of those, those positions that we use as a flex position. So we currently have one. Um, they um, assist with um, answering dispatch phone calls. They are also able to clean the kennels or assist field staff in picking up debts. So, um, so with that additional position, depending on staffing levels and who we have in the phone room, those people could potentially be repurposed and they have been um, to areas that are needed. So for example, if we have um, a fully staffed phone room and a kennel staff member calls out sick, then they're, we're able to move them over to the kennel staff to assist for the day. It just gives us some additional flexibility. Um, and then the interviews for the lead animal control officer position will be conducted at the end of this month. We do have some internal candidates for this position. Um, as um, the commissioners are aware, we are finally, we finally have five fully trained animal control officers. This is the first time that we've had that in, in the time that I've been here. When I first started um, in 2020, we had two um, that were out on the streets uh, because of, of vacancies and, and stuff. So, um, so um, we're looking forward to having a full complement of field officers to assist with the, the calls in the city. Question? Mm -hmm. um, are they just basically covering San Bernardino or do we still got contract cities? No, the officers just cover San Bernardino. Um, we do assist with on-call or emergency coverage for Loma Linda and Grand Terrace, um, but that's only on-call after hours and emergency coverage as needed. We do not do regular services. Um, the volunteer program, I know there were some questions during the last meeting about our volunteer program. So I wanted to give a, a quick overview to the, the, um, uh, to the commissioners as well as the public. So um, our volunteer program is, is um, governed by the city's policy. And so um, the city had a volunteer policy which was approved in 2021. In the packet, you'll find resolution 2021-162, um, which contains the approval from um, the city council, um, as well as the administrative policy itself. Um, and so this is this is the policy that governs our onboarding of volunteers. Um, and um, so um, it's it could be an involved process depending on what happens. So um, People who are interested in volunteering have to apply on the city's website. The applications are all processed through um, the same platform that processes all applications for other jobs in the city, paid positions. So, um, and HR gets all of those. HR then does the first run through the applications and then lets our volunteer program coordinator know that they're ready for review. So this does add some time to the process. And um, we do try and communicate with people that let us know I'm applied to be a volunteer. If we know it in advance, then we do try and like let them know it's going to take some time. And we do check in with um, with HR staff to see what the status on applications is. Um, once um, we do get the applications, our volunteer coordinator reaches out to the applicants and all of them. We don't screen applications for, for volunteer services. 
Um, right now, they do have to be 18 years or older. We are working on the, the underage process. Um, and so that that's really it. And HR would screen for that. So we call everybody who's applied and schedule them for an orientation and tour of the shelter. Um, and so, um, so then once they come and um, they decide that, that yes, they do want to be a part of the program, then we, we um, let HR know so that they can schedule them for a background check, the fingerprint process and everything. So this can take quite an extended period of time. Um, so if you've applied to become a volunteer and have not heard directly from our department, it's somewhere in that process. Um, the other thing that's important to know on the, on the volunteer program is that we do have specific position descriptions and training and requirements um, in a policy manual for each of the volunteers. So in order to do this, you have to have this training and experience so that we can make sure that um, staff and volunteers are safe. Yes, sir. Just for the public record, can you please tell us what website um, there was the other one you can apply on? It's um, spcity.org. And you can access that through um, the city's, the application process is on the city's jobs page or opportunities page, or you can also go to sbcitypets.org and on our volunteer tab, there is a link to the application. Any additional questions? Can I make um, a suggestion? I don't know if it's going to be a motion, but if each of us um, post the link, for volunteering um, either on next door or whatever other sites, you know, any other Jews. Um, there are a lot of people I speak to that don't know to apply and they don't know where to live in my house. Could each of us do that? That can help. And we have included some flyers today. They're on the on the back um, table. Um, we also take those to events and, and um, other places. Um, and they're in both English and Spanish. Our volunteer coordinator is bilingual. So if we do have um, Spanish speaking applicants or applicants, um, members of the community that are more comfortable conversing in Spanish, she's able to do that, train them and onboard them. Two questions. Can I have some of those to take to you on Saturday? Absolutely. And is there anywhere on the website where it has a list of all the employees that you have at the shelter and what they do? No, there or is not positions or something that back. There is not a list on the website. Um, that would be something that could be requested. Um, obviously, you know, we're public employees, so, so names are available, but um, you know, we can give you um I can give a report to the commission next time with an org chart so that you can see exactly what positions we have and where they're utilized from for and as well as position descriptions if that would be helpful. I would like to have that okay. for sure. Thank okay. You. Is that organ an organization you can like, presently found on the website? No. Is it something that we can add to it? Yes. The problem with the website is that um, we're working with the Parks Department to assist us in updating the website. Right now, in order to update the website, the request has to go to the IT department and they update it. City's pretty sh small. There's not a lot of staff in the city. Um, and so sometimes those requests take a long time. Um, and it is something that I think, you know, would obviously be helpful, um, but just there's, there's processes um, uh, that we have to follow in order to do some of those things. So um, hopefully um, once um, we have staff that's trained and maybe some additional assistance, we'll be able to make those changes ourselves. Just right now, it's a, a little tough because people that do that Actually, my volunteer coordinator, I'm able to do that, um, but we don't have a lot of those. Most of our other staff are out in the field direct, directly working with customers or, or other people or, you know, so we don't have a lot of bandwidth to get that, things like that done as much as we might do. And then this is oh, did you have a uh, just a one, I guess, point of clarification. I know that city council members, they post on Facebook, for example, yes. but they cut their comments as well. Well, are we constrained by that policy as well? So if we were to post someone, for example, we must turn the comments off because we cannot engage the public on that form. I, you know, I think that um, the volunteer thing, you know, that's something because you're encouraging um, people to, to do that. 
I think that, you know, I would have to get some direction on that specific question from our city clerk's office and the city attorney's office to see exactly what's allowable versus what's not. Um, we do leave our comments open on our, um, our um, Facebook and Instagram pages. I do have staff that monitor them and respond when necessary. It's not obviously something that they're on all of the time. The staff that do that work Tuesday through Saturday. So um, it's very limited, but they do try and clarify information as much as possible. Um, we do not have access to Nextdoor. In order to post something on Nextdoor, we have to route it to the um, city um, uh, manager's office and they and the PIO's office, and they're the ones that have access to Nextdoor. So we're not able to post things directly on there. I add, um, yeah, we're not, I mean, we're not elected officials and we can post and recommend and say these great opportunities like to become part of the community and volunteer at the shelter and here's the link. And if we all did that on next door, especially because shelter can, that would be super helpful. Also, on, um, I, I do notice on next door yeah. that they're, because of, there's not a lot on next yeah. door, but I screenshot and put it over to next door whenever I see it from Facebook. The one, so that's fine, right? Thank that's you. just sharing. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Grady. Um, I did start a Facebook page and a next door page on the um, passions meetings. Is that okay? I do have to get some direction from the clerk's office and the city attorney's office because that could potentially have some um, repercussions from the Brown Act. Um, but I will get some answers um, and let you know. Okay, all I do is post the thing. Mm -hmm. okay. I kind of thought we were supposed to share what we what was in the meeting. Is that true? So, you know, we want to share with the community and try and educate them. Um, I, it's it's recommended that we try and let the community know ways that they can help the shelter and ways that they can help animals in the community. Um, but there is definitely a fine line, and I admit I'm not the expert on where that line falls, and that's why I have to seek direction from the city clerk and, and city attorney. I just request that we get that as yes. possible. Quick question, Chris, before we move yeah. on. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain number of volunteers that you need? Like, is there a limit or is it no limit? Speak a thousand volunteers. Uh, okay. There really isn't like <laughs> no, as many people just want to come in as possible. Um, and so, you know, we have been building this volunteer program. When I first came in in 2020, um, their, the old volunteer program that PD had set up was wiped out. We had no volunteer. Okay. Um, and then the city put this forward in 2021, and we've been working to build that volunteer program up mm -hmm. um, with guidelines and protocols and everything else because, you know, we want volunteers to, to come in and help, but we want them to be safe. And we want to make it easy for for everybody to understand what they're what what we're asking them to assist with, okay. and that they're trained. And so we have, I think, um, our full time volunteer coordinator started in March of this year, and and um, we were able to bring her in with grant funding, but she will be moved. Both the volunteer coordinator and foster coordinator positions are being moved to the general fund, um, and sometimes we do that in order to prove their worth to, to um, the mayor and city council so that we can request funding from the general fund for those positions. So um, she started in March of this year and we now have, I think, 45 or 50 fully vetted onboarded volunteers. And that's made a huge impact on what we can do. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, we went to, um, a community event a few weeks ago and we had volunteers come in, um, same thing with the foster and I mean, they're, they kind of, they work very closely together because there's a lot of overlap between the fosters and the volunteers. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's been a game changer for us. And, you know, the more people that come in, even if they just come in to do laundry or dishes, that frees up one of my kennel attendants to work directly with the animals. 
Um, dog walking right now is not one of the things that that is a, a job right now um, because that comes with a lot of risks. And we've been working on you know some of those best practices and what training is needed and how do we teach people how to read dog body language so they're not putting themselves and others at risk. Um, and we want to make sure that that we're, we're their handling skills are good enough and and we're also working to rate the dogs, right? So um, so our intention is to rank the dogs with like a color system. So, you know, green dogs are those dogs that are easy to leash up and simple to walk. And that's what we're starting with. Once we have that all put together, then we'll start training the volunteers and they'll be able to do the great. And we're building on that. So it's a slow process mm -hmm. just because, you know, I think, you know, when you're talking about staffing and shelter programming, part of the thing that goes into that is also administration, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and so um, I've been able to ask Jasmine to help staff create that, so that we can move that forward because this is a program that we've been talking about for six months or more and trying to get launched. And we just haven't been able to because we haven't had somebody to sit down and be able to put all of that together, train staff, get it launched. So, um, so yeah, I'm sorry, that was a long answer for you. No. <laughs> so yeah, but as many people who want to come in and help, we'll take them off. Uh, you know, if I had like a hundred people show up one day, I think I would, I would cry from happiness. <laughs> so, is, it, so <laughs> is there a minimum hours that they have to do or they can just come in for um, an hour? Or... Right now it's 10 hours per month, but we're trying to see if we can reduce that. Um, you are able to, without going through a background check, if somebody just wants to come in one day and, and work and do volunteer for eight hours or less, we, we can do that. We have had groups come in. So for example, um, we've been able to connect with corporations and have had groups of students or other people come in and just do like a cleaning. So we have a bunch of trailers with storage. Staff mm -hmm. isn't able to work on those and get those organized. So we can have a group of like 20, 30 volunteers coming at one time and, and staff says, okay, we need to do X, Y, and Z, puts them to work. And, and it's kind of like magic, things happen and things are organized after that. So, um, so yeah, there's an opportunity. And in that instance, those people may only come to the shelter one time. We have a waiver that they're able to sign. Those types of opportunities wouldn't be directly related to the animals, but they would definitely help support staff. Any further discussion? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn on to turn now to a three on statistics. Yes. So, um, so for your st statistics, um, again, um, as last time, I run them. I look at them monthly, then I look at them calendar year to date, and then fiscal year to date. So, um, and. Right now, um, we are, um, we're running pretty um, high um, as far as numbers are concerned. And I, I just noticed that I am missing the, the starting numbers of the, the top of the monthly totals. Um, and so I'll amend that and push it back out and add it to the um, next agenda as a correction. Um, but um, we are trending pretty high. If you look at the calendar year to date, um, and you're looking at the total number of dogs and cats that have come in, we're already at 4,900. Um, last year for 12 months, we brought in over 5,000. So we brought in 5,100 um, animals for all of 2022. So far in 2023, we have brought in 4,900. And again, this is like for the most part, the city of San Bernardino, we do um, have contracts with Grand Terrace and Loma Linda, but the number of animals they bring in, it's tiny. Um, I think the numbers last year, as a matter of fact, looking at Loma Linda for all of 2022, um, they brought in um, 47 animals. So they're not... The, the community that's having the impact on these numbers is our own. Um, and we've discussed before how um, animal welfare right now is in crisis mode and this is across the country. 
Um, you know, I do have connections in other areas of the country that used to not be impacted by, by the crisis, but it has finally reached them. Um, I have um, a colleague who works in Pennsylvania at, the, at an FPCA up there that pulls from other shelters. I've reached out to them directly and the crisis has hit them and they're, they're above capacity as well and have been for the past year. So, um, you know, there are things that, that we're looking at to try and combat some of the, these issues, um, you know, but things are, are rough right now all over. And, and um, I think that, you know, we're continuing to do things to the best of our ability, including expanded access to vet care. Um, but um, until we're able to get the vets on board and offer those spay neuter services, um, I think that that we're going to continue to see higher than normal intakes. Um, and yes, we've been housing multiple dogs per kennel, and and, and it comes at a huge risk. Um, but the other side of that is that we really don't want to euthanize our time or space. Um, so, um, you know, we are working on solutions on the other end. And again, those don't happen very quickly, um, because we are a municipal agency, um, any sort of request for, for, um, facilities goes through a process. If it's above a certain dollar amount, we have to get approval. Um, and, um, we have to get at least three quotes for things. So, mm -hmm. I honestly believe that this increase in dogs and deaths is because of people who are breeding for an income. That is what's going on. I mean, it's all over Craigslist, all over, I mean, it's everywhere. They are selling puppies by the hundreds and kittens. And I'm sorry, that's kind of when you're done. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I mean, is there any solutions for these backyard breeders to put them out of this space? So, um, so for those, if somebody has, um, like, for example, we had a public comment earlier with a specific address. Um, my officers will go out and 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 you know try and enforce the law and potentially write citations based on the evidence, but. We do, you know, we're talking about law enforcement and we can ask to, to see animals. If we have proof, like somebody can send us a post, um, we'll absolutely follow up on that. But we can't demand to be let into somebody's home to see what's going on. Those are things that are outside of our ability to do. What if neighbors take pictures or something? They can, but again, and, you know, we can cite them, but that's, that's the extent of what we are able to do. And, and we do. So those animals end up at the shelter, they're returned to the owner, we find them. If it comes in again, we usually send them over to APC. And I think last week we had two dogs that came in unaltered, the owner came in and, and redeemed them and they went over to APC to be spayed or neutered. So, um, so there's small things that we're able to do. I will say like on Craigslist and Facebook and, and a lot of those other places where they're posting animals for sale, even though they're posting in San Bernardino's page, they may not live in our jurisdiction. So let's say like, you know, they're posting something and, you know, we call them and they say, we just want to meet you at one location because that's usually what happens. And that's where people get like um, ripped off with, with like the puppy stuff too, right? Um, but they may live in Rialto. They may live in Fontana. They may not live in San Bernardino in particular. Um, but if they do, then it just needs to be reported. It can either be called in to our, um, our, our, um, our dispatch, um, or, um, uh, people can make a complaint on the city's, um, complaint system, which is online on the website. And it comes to us and, and officers go out on activities. And, and, yeah. I was just going to say, um, Backyard breeding, selling, and whatnot has been an issue since I got into rescue. Um, so we can't just reduce or deduce the animal welfare crisis that we're currently going through to backyard breeding. It's so complicated. So there's so much, there's so much more 
behind the current issue. It's it's not one thing in particular, and that has always been an issue. And then there's also, I can't remember when the law was passed regarding um, puppy mills or just even pet shops, but that helped somewhat, but you know, it's it's been there for since I got into rescue. You know, it's a combination of things. I definitely that. Yeah. Yes. Do you have anything for the end? Um, and yeah, I think that's it for the statistics. Okay, an additional discussion on the statistics. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, so if we do get to a point, and it's, I'm mentioning it now because it is related to these stats, mm -hmm. um, where we do say, okay, as a commission, let's get together and draft some recommendations to city council. Um, would I make a motion to put that on the agenda for next meeting with my ideas? Yes. yes. Okay. So, that so based on I, that's what I was okay. going to ask you afterwards. Yes. So based on the number issue that you know we've been seeing for the year, I would like to make a motion um, to spend some time as a commission um, writing up recommendations to bring forward to city council. Good. We have a motion from uh, Commissioner Hatton. Do I get a second? Second. Second, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is moved by Commissioner Hatton and probably seconded uh, by Commissioner Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. So, I'll have it. It's the, the motion is Angela would like to. Can you just. Okay, so the, mo the motion, as an correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Hatton, uh, during the next meeting, or are you requesting a special meeting? Does anyone have any I, feedback on that? <laughs> I would like to request a special meeting. I don't think that's a, I mean, it's something it's like a discussion, basically. We could just put it on the agenda for the upcoming meetings for the rest of the year, just put on for November and December and just flip them out. Because I'm, I'm sure after the first meeting, there might be uh, more discussion and stuff, people, you know, research or whatever. Or stuff. As long as it doesn't just become a discussion at each meeting, as long as we actually draft something within an adequate amount of time so we can bring something. And you think that the right. and they don't keep putting us in the box. Exactly. Yes. Can you clarify what you were saying? Well, I, I was just, you know, basically, uh, we don't need a special meeting. Just put it on the agenda. You know, just put it on the agenda. We could discuss it. And by the time, by the time next month comes up, everybody here, could come up with uh, ideas and stuff to to bring up reference that agenda item. And so from a staffing perspective, if I may weigh in, um, it would be a little bit easier for us um, because we are a small team to do it at the next regular meeting. I think, you know, if you guys think about ideas um, and you send them to, to us at least a week before the meeting, um, preferably like 10 days or so, um, we can agendize it based on categories, like right? So like, you know, one of the categories is animal housing, another category is staffing. And then that way it's agendized on a public meeting and then you can bring forth your specific ideas during the time. And then we can come up with, you guys can come up with as a team specific recommendations based on those things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so the proposal is then that we... Okay. Okay, I just wanted to ask, forgot. <laughs> um, is there any way we can send out, we can like email each other or email you to send to us um, our, each of our ideas so we can all think about the different. That's a, that would be a serial meeting under the Brown Act. Oh. And so that's why I'm asking you guys to email us so that we well, can agendize it. Well, but I can't then share it back with you guys. I would oh, I, I would put it on the agenda so that the public could then see that because that when you're talking about serial meetings, and that's where it's really difficult to get into trouble with the Brown Act, right? Because then if you know you guys are it's kind of like you're yeah, you're using somebody to to talk on your behalf or share that information, but it's still something that you're talking about outside of a public audience. Yeah. Okay. And this is just as far as the fosters for the, the large dogs for, for fosters. How long does that turnaround take to become a foster at the shelter? Like, 
Yeah. That's immediate. Is it immediate? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So if people yeah. reach out, well, there's an email, staff reads it like on Tuesday through Saturday. If there's a specific dog somebody has in mind, we try and do the visit as quickly as possible. And that application is the same day. So for example, if somebody comes in and says, I found this dog, one of the questions we ask them is, would you like to hang and hold on to the animal for us? We can supply you with food, everything else you need. And then we do the application, they go home with it that same day. Okay, so. Okay, so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not like it. You don't go through background check boxes for that. Okay. That was a good question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify something. My neighbor has a dog. Mm -hmm. And I, I told him, and I've told several people, just go down to the shelter and apply to be a foster. And you foster the dog if you can hold on to them. Mm -hmm. Right? Do they have to bring the dog with them? Um, if they bring the dog with them, we're able to vaccinate and again scan for a microchip. Oh, okay. And and so um, so if they found a stray and um, they can bring that down, we have a report. We'll put it into the system too, so we can take a picture and put it in our system as a foster. Um, that way, if somebody is looking for that animal, we can connect them with the with the person who has it. Okay. Uh, so there was a motion that was made by Commissioner Happen to at the next meeting this. Uh, Discuss as a commission potential policies and draft proposals that we can send to the council. Okay. We get a second from Commissioner Vanities. Is it a second from, I'm oh, sorry, Commissioner Henderson? Oh, yes, it's Commissioner Henderson. So it's been moved by Commissioner Happen, Happen and seconded by Commissioner Henderson. Is there any further discussion on this? Hearing seeing none. All in favor? Aye. All opposed. Okay. We're going to move on now to item number four on our agenda. Um, I'm going to just ask, this is regarding community cats. I'm just going to ask, Chris, were you the one who added this to the yes, Okay, understood. Deferring to you now. All right. So um, I know there were a lot of questions about um, cats, specifically community cats. And so um, I do, I, I did include some information on the agenda from a couple of the national animal control um, agencies and, and welfare organizations specifically regarding um, programs on community cats. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, going back a few years, um, what used to happen with, with problem cats in the community, um, they can be feral, they can be um, uh, owned, they can be semi-owned. There's a whole spectrum of, of um, um, social build, social um, uh, status or social, like the other, social, I can't say that word, um, social ability for the cats, I, like, yeah. So, um, so they can, from completely feral, to like, I just want to sit in your lap and, and that's all I want to do. Um, cats are free roaming. Um, and so there is no leash law in the state of California stating that cats have to be indoors. Of course, that's something that we always recommend because it's safer for the cats. Um, but that is not something that is required. Um, and you have a lot of people in the communities that let their cats inside and outside. And, and, you know, they, um, and they just wander. Um, cats are really good at adopting people. I think mm -hmm. they were the ones that, that, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, domesticated themselves about 10,000 years ago. And they're really good at like, they have several owners in the neighborhood if they're inside and outside. And once the neighbors talk to each other, oh, you know, you can, I've been feeding that cat for years. It's my cat, it comes in at night. So, so knowing that and, and pet owners having that expectation, well, my cat is inside outside, I haven't seen it for a day or two, but it always comes back. People don't come to look for their cats at animal shelters. Studies have proven that only about two to 3% of cats that are brought into a shelter are returned back to their home. And the communities that that impacts the most are low income communities, communities of color. And, and so, you know, essentially for years, we were stealing people's cats and adopting them out to somebody else. Um, and so when it was realized um, by a lot of these national organizations, one of the recommendations um, became not to impound cats, healthy free roaming cats um, for that reason. If you leave them in the community, they're, I think, Six times more likely, something like that. Six times more likely to find their way home. 
um, 13 times, yeah, 13 times more likely to find their way home. So um, by just neighbors sharing and talking about the cats. And so that is one of the reasons why um, we did stop taking in friendly stray cats. Um, uh, but we will always take in um, injured cats. Um, we will take in sick cats um, and um, cats that have been abandoned. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the discussion around cats has changed, including feral cats too. I know TNR is a best practice and that's trap neuter release. Um, unfortunately, the lack of, of spay neuter resources has kind of limited our ability to do that. And specifically in COVID in 2020, where um, spay neuter services were suspended because they weren't considered a, a, a crucial resource, that set us back a bit with cats. Cats in particular um, tend to have large litters. Um, feral cats were moved from the neighborhood um, and brought into a shelter and subsequently euthanized. They create what's called a vacuum effect in the community. And what um, studies have shown and proven is that once that happens, once that cat's gone, another cat's gonna move into their, their space and or the remaining cats have larger litters to, to compensate for that animal being gone. And so you're kind of treading water with your head constantly going below the surface when, when you implement um, things like that, where you remove the animal from, from the community. Conversely, taking that cat, running it to the vet, um, sniffing it, clipping the ear so that everybody knows it's been um, neutered and putting it right back where it came from has been shown to reduce cat populations significantly over time. Um, the city of Albuquerque um, did this and they did a study. Over three years of doing this, they saw the cat populations decrease by 37%, right? So, so that is one of those things that, that we're working on. Um, again, this is not done. We can't do it in large numbers like I really want to, um, to in order to reduce the number of kittens coming in, everything else. And I know it's, it's really hard, especially if you're, in the community and you see an, a neonatal kitten and you don't know where mom is and, and you're worried about it, I, I get it, I'm the same way. Um, you know, But bringing that cat in isn't going to have an impact on the population at all. So there are some things that we do recommend. Um, we recommend trying to leave those kittens with mom. Um, we have a whole flyer, did we bring in the flyer? Okay. So um, we'll, we'll bring that next time, but you can go um, to our, shelter website we have um, flyers for the community about how to handle um, stray roaming cats and stuff in their community um, so that we can hopefully once we get the senior resources in um, I'm hoping that we can have like a TNR day once a month or something like that in the different communities um, but for right now if cats are a problem in your neighborhood and you suspect that there's somebody hoarding cats or there's a house that has an inordinate number of cats and they're, they're feeding, let us know. My officers will go out and have a conversation with them. If we're able to bring in a couple of cats at a time and get them altered, we have done that in a couple of areas and we're willing to kind of go out and investigate um, to see if that's something that we can have an impact on. Kitten season will be coming up. Cat, the cat reproductive cycle is, is seasonal to some extent here in California where we do enjoy warm weather throughout most of the year. Um, it's not as seasonal as it is in other areas like New York. Um, but um, kitten season traditionally in our area begins in like February, March. And that's when you start to see large litters of kittens um, in neighborhoods. And yeah, and, um, and so, you know, right now is the time to let us know about areas where you're seeing a large number of cats, feral cats, so that we can try and go out and, and get some of them and, and spay and neuter a few of them um, before kitten season begins in earnest. Um, and so, again, we're we're pretty limited at the moment as far as um, those services are concerned. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I... There's been public misinformation and misconceptions about TNR and many cat programs for years. And then I got written up at a school I worked at a few years ago for TNR, a few cats that were on that campus. And I remember fighting with the district about it 
because they quoted PETA and a few other groups that said it's considered cruelty to abandon a cat. And it was a huge fight that I didn't win. And um, so I think that the getting that information out to the general public, because I think with an animal welfare, we get that, but it's, a, it's not understood in the general public. And if that's maybe another thing we, you know, start to share on next door and just let people know, because there are people who think they're helping by trapping cats and bringing them to the board at SBC. And I think SBC is doing more to communicate that, but I know DeVore, I don't know that they're communicating that. So it would be the beacon of that light. And then they trap cats and then chickens. Sometimes, which makes a, another problem. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Yeah, kittens are left. Yes, the yeah. kittens are left. Yeah. And then yeah. found at some point, and it, it, it's a big yeah. vicious cycle. Yes. Yeah. Do we have any cages for trapping? limited and that would be something so normally what we do um is my officers go out they work with the person who's reporting them we leave the trap and check them and so um because then that way we can make sure that 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 we are doing like everything that we need to do and when that happens um because we had a bunch of um feral cats in the parking structure here um and and we worked on they're all fixed now <laughs> So like, um, and, and um, so when we do that, we put in activities for my officers and there's, a, it's a, a trap check. So they check first thing in the morning and again in the evening so that we can make sure that we're not leaving animals in, in traps for too long. Um, and it also is based on the conditions. So if it's like really hot outside, we're not going to keep that trap open during the day and during the middle of summer where it's really, really hot. Um, we're going to try and put that trap in a location where it's relatively protected and more just set it overnight. Do you mean, or can people go and borrow traps from the shelter if they want to well, try to Well, that's a better idea. I think mean, having them go out and do that, um, I don't know. But they have them. limited, such limited staffing, right? Yeah. To do limited um, staffing. Unless for them to do that, like, and again, it's, so unless usually they get volunteer. Right. Like and that, that might be yeah. something too that, that could be helpful. Um, what we normally do is that I usually have a couple of officers. We start doing it on days where I have an overlap of officers. So I have a team of officers that works Sunday through Thursday and another team that works Tuesday through Saturday. And so that, that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is the overlap time where I have more staffing in the field than the other days of the week. Um, and so usually when we have projects like that, that's usually the assignment during those days so that we have sufficient coverage. Um, and we're not like letting other things slip. And I also have some officers that work earlier than late. And, and so they get in before um, the phones go on. So they're able to clear any pending activities that weren't completed the day prior. So, um, so that way we can be more effective. But yeah, I think letting us know, calling us and putting that the address or area on our map helps us track that because we're also trying to put that in a spreadsheet. So even if we aren't able to get to that area right now, um, our officers will still reach out to our feet, have that conversation and try and see those. Can, uh, can I motion to have a flyer made up so we can pass that out? And we have a flyer, so I'm happy to email it to all of the commissioners. I'm happy to email. So we have a couple of flyers. We have flyers to say what what to do if you you find a, a kitten, what to do if there's cats in your neighborhood. Um, staff has been able to put together a whole bunch of those, and so um, we're happy to send those over to you guys. Okay. Yeah. So I like the um. So you, you said that you know um, some of the cats belong to people and, and stuff like that. People just, now I, I know it's not state law, of course, it's not state law, but back when I worked, I, do you guys still have the program where you can, if, if somebody requests it, can you license a cat still and, and yes. give them give it a tag, even yes. though it's not required? You can also bring your cat down for a microchip. Um, that's the best way to get a cat back um, to its owner if it does happen to get somewhere. But again, even better than that, is trying to leave it inside as much as possible. Um, just because, you know, even if, you know, the neighbors are helping out, um, that doesn't reduce the likelihood that they're going to either get hit by a car or um, preyed on by a coyote, by an owl, by, you know, um, 
a bobcat, you know, there's there's a bunch of things out there that that could take cats away. And so we always recommend first keep them inside, you know, put if you they need to be outdoors, try and put them in an enclosure, like a, what they're calling catios now for, for cats, um, so that they get the experience outside, um, but that they're completely protected and safe. You know, in my neighborhood, there's 18 cats, and they know exactly what time the lady's gonna feed them in the morning and at night. So I think I need that number. You can go talk. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you can there are 18 yeah. cats. Yeah. Wow. And those are probably the ones that you can see because cats are really good at hiding themselves here. <laughs> Yeah, but they're there every morning at seven and at five. Yeah. That's my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I turned to red and you were gonna pick them up. And yeah. You went to the house. Yeah. Then because they had six puppies, uh, little cats, yeah. and they hit them. And that's that's the problem that we deal with because we can't we can't force our way into a, a house and. Even if people report it, if the person is uncooperative, we may be able to cite them, but we can't force them into, into complying. And that's and a lot of people will use citations as like they, they wind up paying them. Now, you know, we people that are, are a constant nuisance or, or not uh, replying, we do try and go day after day. Um, if it's, if, you know, especially with dogs, if there's a major issue with dogs and, and loose animals, in the, the community, we try and, and do follow-ups as often as possible. Um, but that is definitely a challenge, getting people to let us in and allow us um, access or to see animals. Um, it can be a challenge. Any additional discussion on this item? I see, hearing us, let's go ahead and move on now to uh, item number five on our agenda, dog licensing. This is this yes. also from the agenda? Yes. Okay. Um, although I think there was some questions about dog licensing too. So um, I think one of the things is like dog licensing, um, our compliance rate is pretty low. I just wanted to let the commission know that we are looking into um, a private entity to assist us to contract with for licensing. Um, and um, this, this um, entity is currently doing licensing programs throughout the state. Um, and uh, is looking at contracting with some of the local agencies as well that would ensure um, kind of a, a consistent approach to dog licensing, especially in our region. Um, and um, they also have the ability, they have like, they hire cans, so that can be something that we can go at with, you know, an additional cost involved and something that we, you know, we look at. Um, we did have canvassing positions and I, I tried to recruit for them and it was, it was yeah, it was the best. I, I think in this day and age, that's a particularly difficult position to recruit for. We might, we wound up repurposing them to shelter tenants or something that, that was more useful um, to our needs. Um, so, um, so um, yeah, it's, I just wanted to let you guys know that we were, we are looking into <clears throat> contracting with a private entity to expand our, our licensing capability. Is that, do you say one to four? Is it down there? Yes. What was the name of it? DocuPet. I did look at it. Uh, yeah. Yes. So it was, was well, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. yeah, it did seem uh, good thing. Yeah. Absolutely, it, it it's definitely has some benefits. They have some really good statistics. Um, I have um, colleagues that have contracted with them and they have really good things to say about their program and services. Um, and so I'm confident that, that they could definitely take us to the next level. And, and what this also does by contracting with somebody else to take care of that service, it's the billing, it's everything else. It's, they get the, the certificates from the vet's office and they do, they're uploaded and they, they automatically bill them for that, um, or the, the people who own the, the pets and then we get that information. So we should have additional information on animals. For us to do licensing, we have to hire a lot more staff in order to focus on that. Right now, licensing is, is something that my customer service staff do in addition to their other duties like adoptions, um, helping people with fosters 
answering phones. And so I'd much rather um, be able to have the, that those team members shift their focus to the most immediate need, which is the animals in the shelter and trying to connect with the, the, the residents about some of those issues than like processing the licensing and stuff. Because if we can contract with somebody and there's a really low cost um, to the department and to the city, that's going to be worth its weight in bold and it's going to help us. Yeah, I called over yes. there and talked to somebody that was ahead of that and she said it was working out really bad. So absolutely. I think Riverside County is looking at that too. Uh, so a lot of entities are are partnering with them. Commissioner Blake. So our so our, what you know, so that was a licensure. Mm -hmm. So um so are, is, would they go out and so they're gonna basically just go out and contact them. Or would they sell a license in the field like we did? Or they would just give them the information to submit it online or so right now we're specifically looking at just the 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 regular licensing program. The canvassing program is very new to them. Um, and so that would be something that we'd have to dive into. I believe from what I read, it is kind of a door-to-door -door canvas. But they they I, I don't know if they hire temporary people to go do that, but the the pet. The DocuPet platform itself would take over all of the licensing. So right? you would, so, so you would, they would just do uh, in person licensing, or then they would do all the mail and all the renewals. So they would do all of the billing. There would be a link to their website on our website, and people could still come to the shelter and pay for their license, and we let them know. But ideally, they would just go to the website that we would have a link on our website, it, and they'd be able to click on that. It would take it to them over to their website and they'd make the payment. They would do all of the notices, including the delinquent notices and everything else, um, according to our fee structure. So, um, and the and they send more, they send multiple notices out. The other thing that they would be able to do that we don't have the staffing and resources for is to take all of those brand new gravy vaccines from the vets, put them into their system before somebody purchases a license and bill people for it. Like they'd send out a notice that says, oh, by the way, we know you have a dog and um, licensing is required. Here's your bill. And that's something that we just don't have the staffing or resources to do at the moment. Um, and in order to have a successful licensing program, that is definitely a piece of that, that pie that needs to be followed up on. Um, and they would do that. They also have people that work the phones, answer questions, do all sorts of things that, that you know, would take some of the pressure off of our staff here at the shelter um, so that they can focus on other areas. And then they will also, if their dog passed away, they mm -hmm. would also notify them and take them out of the system. Yeah. Yeah. And we would get that notification too. So, um, and they, they, because of their experience throughout the state, um, they have, uh, they're already set up with our like software platform. So our database, it would be able to talk with them and, and we get updates immediately about animals in the community that licensed with them, you know, within like the next day. So we'd be an upload, download every day and we'd have that information in the system. So if one of my animal control officers drives out, picks up a stray animal, they can look that up and say, I have, this dog doesn't have a tag on here, but hmm, there's a dog named Barney that matches that description at that house over there. And they could potentially go knock on the door and say, hey, is this your dog? Um, so hopefully that would do a couple of things. It would keep us from having impound Barney at the shelter <laughs> and hope that their, their owner comes in. It, it would give us contact with the pet owner. Um, you know, we would potentially be able to offer a microchip in the field if the pet didn't have a microchip and return it back to the owner and then, you know, let them know if the animal isn't altered, that they need to get it altered and have that, that discussion with them right then and there. Would the software also cross reference like uh, addresses? And stuff because when I did it, you go out and one lady in particular went out, sold her three licenses, and then she went down to the animal shelter and got the other three licenses for the other three dogs. So and then all of a sudden you, you found out she's got six dogs, but they're all licensed. Right. That I don't know about. Right. Like, <laughs> but are we okay with yeah. that in this day and age? I would say yes. Yeah, well, yeah. But I mean, you know, just back in the day, you're I mean still you're right. only allowed three dogs. Yes. So I mean you don't need to 
You're only allowed three dogs, but that, that, you know, it, again, it's it's one of those things where, are they you know, yeah, yeah. Exactly. if we don't have and complaints, we're not going to know about it. Yeah, the shelter. Their alter, yeah, they're mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I think, you know, for us, it's it's definitely something that could definitely assist us and help us in a couple of different areas. But but that's good because uh, if they go get the rabies vaccinations, then that automatically triggers this company yeah. say, hey, now, now you need a license. Exactly. So that, that, I think yeah. that's good. Yeah, and the more um, the more shelters that are doing that and logging onto the system, no matter if like you live in, in San Bernardino, you know, but you go to a vet in Highland and they get that, then we get that, right? So, you know, same thing, like, you know, they may be pulled for, for a different area, but since they're covering this whole area, San Bernardino and the county, they get documents from all of our vets and they can notify us immediately and they can get the bill. Now here, here, where their software be able to recognize the postal addresses. Like yes. you got you got some you got yeah. you got people in Highland that they don't live in Highland, they live in San Bernardino, right. they just have a postal address of Highland and yeah. Rialto and Colton. The the, and the wonderful thing about um uh, the GIS or geographic information system mapping and Esri, um most most um, software um, programs, including ours, so if you go to the city website and you're looking at maps of council wards and stuff, that's all done through Esri, through GIS. And so that is a platform that every single you know entity like this would use. And so yes, they would have that down to the actual parcel because they would have that GIS mapping data that says, oh yeah, that guy on that side of the street belongs to the city of San Bernardino, but that address on the other side of the city uh, of the street belongs to county. And so yes, they would have that. Okay, that's cool. Uh, I just want to bring this to everybody's attention. We have uh, this lovely website here for different Dr. Pets. So if you guys are interested in getting any uh, additional information on this licensing service, it's right here, docupet.com. Is there any further discussion on this topic? All right, let's go ahead and move on now to agenda item six, upcoming events. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, so today um, we were able to give um, the, I don't know if you guys in the city are familiar with the Center for Individual Development that is run by the Parks Department. Um, they um, work with and offer programs and services to people with special needs, um, adults and uh, young adults. And so uh, we were able to give them a tour of the shelter today. Um, and so they can kind of learn about animals and stuff. Um, on uh, next week, um, we have been invited for pet therapy at Cal State uh, University of San Bernardino. Um, so we'll be going up there and taking some of our adoptable animals with us. Um, this is really exciting and something that we've talked about for, for <laughs> over a year um, at, in our, our um, shelter. Um, and we offer food to people who need it, but it's not a formal organized event. Um, with the addition of, of the staffing and stuff, uh, with Jasmine and Natalie, um, it was one of the things I said that's on my wish list, that I really want to help the community and have an organized pet food pantry, especially since Daisy's Hope, that was a wonderful organization, lost their lease at the, at the airport and isn't able to provide those services. So... On Monday the 23rd, um, we are going to have a pet food pantry, a drive through pet food pantry at the shelter. Um, we have some flyers in the back. Um, again, this is for anybody who needs it. Like they need help supporting their animals. We want them to keep their pets. I don't want their pets to end up at the shelter because they're having a hard time feeding them. So it's 10, 23, 23. What time is it at? 10, 6, um, we said, I think nine, nine to 11, nine to 11. We have a flyer back there. So grab a flyer on your way out. We did print those. Um, and so our intention is to hold a pet food pantry at the shelter the fourth Monday of every month. And we did Mondays because we're close to the public that will limit the amount of traffic going through. So they can, we can just do a drive through in our parking lot and, and load people food uh, up with food. Um, we'll have some other supplies too, leashes, harnesses, and stuff that we can give to them. You hold your Can you go back? You said pet therapy. I can't say anything. Um, ten seventeen. Ten what times? 
Um, that I will have to check and see. We're going, yeah, we're going over to them. I think they have a small event there and they've requested our, our attendance. Do you need food donations for the pet pantry? <laughs> if, if people would like to donate like bags, yes. Um, because we could potentially use it for the pantry or we could put it into our office. We have a, 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 a shelf that we put in there with, and we, we stock it with food every day. Um, we do work with um, Amazon. We receive some of their donations and um, we are going out bi-weekly. You know, they're like open bags and stuff, um, but they're still it's still usable food. Um, and so we do have um, quite a bit of dog food at the shelter right now and catheter. Um, but, um, you know, we will always accept additional donations um, just for the community um, because one of the other events that we do monthly um, is the fourth Friday at Second Lake mm -hmm. and that will be 1027. We are working with Pastor Jones um, and we have, a it, it's it's outreach to the, the unhoused um, and people who are, are, are struggling to make ends meet. Um, they set up a whole bunch of booths with services and support for that community. And we have, we have been going for almost a year now and we set up a table. Um, one of my animal control officers goes, um, uh, and we offer vaccines and microchips for free to the unhoused or people who are having a, a difficult time making ends meet. Um, and, um, you know, talk to them about opportunities with the language and they should have their animals spayed or neutered. Um, and so that is something that we've been doing for a while now. So, um, and we also take, take food obviously to that one. So people would like to donate, we'll, out, we'll absolutely take it. The other event that we have on 1026 is the Lutheran Social Services Harvest Festival. Again, that is geared at um, people in need. And so we will be going with um, microchips and vaccines um, in order to try and, and support people who need it. I, I mean, that benefits us with the vaccines and the microchip um, vaccines in particular, because we see a lot of distemper and parvo in our community because people haven't been able to afford to get their animals vaccinated. So. And what time is that? Um, that I will give you the flyer. I, I have the events. I didn't write the time down. So, um, and then on 11 3. Um, I'm sorry, I just, you should read your question. Yes, I, I just want to ask you once. I get a lot of people on next door and right, saying they want to give up their dogs yeah. because they can't afford to train them anymore. What is a good suggestion for them? They can come and get food. Oftentimes it isn't just like food, that's the challenge. Um, but if they need help with veterinary care, you know, because the, the animal is sick or has something that they need for the, the pet, um, they can reach out to the Lang Foundation. Um, they don't have unlimited funding, but that might be something that they're able to assist them with. Um, but we can absolutely help with food. Um, is it also an alternative for them to come down? They instead of turning it in, can they find a foster? Or no, no, no. no. Yeah. They, I don't know what to tell us. No, people. they can if they need food, they can come down and and get food. Right. Okay. Um, if they need medical um, help, veterinary help and support, they can contact the Lang Foundation. Okay. Um, and um, we are, I reached out to an organization that's been active in LA, um, specifically around animals and housing issues. Um, and they're going to, to give us a training and hopefully some support and contacts. So if the issue is that they can't afford a pet deposit or, or having struggles with housing and keeping their pet in the future, that's something else that we're hoping to be able to add to our little um, resource book right now. We don't have that, um, but we're looking to be able to have that at a future And just for the record, Chris, I just want to make sure that the phone number that I have here is correct. Lang Foundation is 909 600 0738. Yes. Just for public record, 909 600 0738. That is the phone number to the Lang Foundation. And then um, on 11 3, 
Um, staff will be taking um, some kittens and friendly cats over to the Center for Individual Development um, for kitten therapy with the, with the um, folks over there. Yeah. Oh, um, the other thing I want to mention is you may have seen that, and I did bring the article, um, you may have seen that the article in the in the San Bernardino Sun by um, David Allen, um, but we were able to um, bring staff to the last mayor and city council meeting and they were able to set up a table um, with one of our really adoptable dogs and a couple of kittens. One of the kittens got adopted as a result of that, but our plan moving forward is to, to have that table um, at each of the, the mayor and city council meetings. We gather at about five right before closed session and um, staff will stay there until seven um, when um, the, the, the open session starts. Um, so that's also an opportunity to see some of our adoptable dogs and what we're trying to focus it in on are our best dogs. And we usually have on our website or social media and at the shelter, we have our 10 best dogs. So these are dogs that have been a play group that are, are, you know, we haven't noticed any, any behavior issues at the shelter. Um, they walk well on a leash. Um, potentially they might be in a foster home. And so we're really trying to push those dogs out because they're also some of our longest um, stays. Um, you know, I, yeah, and they're, like I said, they've been to play groups and we know that their behavior with other dogs is. All right. Any further questions? Can I, can I, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. can I um, ask you to um, put this out there for this weekend? Yeah, the Spook Fest, Saturday, October 14th, from 12 to 5. It's at Calamusa on Cherry Valley. And they are going to be having a doggy costume contest. So it is from 12 to 5. And it's um, from um, 1008 Cherry Valley Boulevard, Calamusa. And it's a uh, deep it up grand opening, but Rotary Club has a lot of different sponsors for this. Celebrities, of course. Ready? Any further discussion on this topic? Seeing and hearing none, moving on to agenda item number seven, adjournment. Can I get a motion to affirm adjournment until next month? Okay, it has been moved by Commissioner Blake. Can we get a second? Okay, it has been moved by Commissioner Blake and properly seconded by Commissioner Kaplan. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'm <laughs> 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 